Hey everybody, before we start the show, I just wanted to let you know that this episode of Tabletop Babble is brought to you by Hero Forge. Hero Forge, they are the incredible makers of fully customizable miniatures with dozens of fantasy races and thousands of parts to choose from. They have easy to use design tools that let you build the perfect mini. You can do this online for free using a fully 3D in-depth character creator right in your web browser. Hero Forge offers custom minis in a variety of materials, including plastic and metal. Plus, you can download model files for use with 3D printers at home. That's pretty awesome. Hero Forge is constantly expanding their catalog with customization options. It's true, I'm on there every week building stuff for fun. I've bought lots of minis from Hero Forge. Always quality, always holds up well. I am a big Hero Forge fan. So, guess what? Hero Forge is running a Black Friday slash Cyber Monday sale. That's right. It actually starts the day this podcast drops. So you should go check it out because it only runs until December 2nd. You get $5 off one physical miniature with the code RPG Holiday. That's all caps, no spaces. RPG Holiday. Go to Hero Forge. Tell them DSPN sent you. This is Tabletop Babble. I'm James Intercasso. Today on the show, I am talking with Sage Stafford. Sage is one of the incredible cast members on The Venture Maidens, and now Sage is the Dungeon Master for a Venture Maidens Baldur's Gate Descent into Avernus experience. Uh, Sage is also Kara in the regular lineup of The Venture Maidens, uh, an incredible role player, an incredible person. You're going to hear a great interview with one of the best actual players out there. Here is my interview with Sage. Okay, everybody. Now I am here with one of my favorite people, one of my favorite role players, uh, and now one of my favorite dungeon masters to watch. Sage, for people who don't know, who are you and what do you do in the world of tabletop role playing games? Hello. What is up? Um, Yes. So I'm Sage. Uh, I play the wonderful and sultry Cara Brynhilda on the Venture Maidens, your dwarven barbarian, now dwarven barbarian cleric, uh, <laughs> after the completion of her last arc. And so, yeah, Venture Maidens is a show that's been around for four years now. Wow. And I I know, right? Just where did the time go? <laughs> Holy moly. Yeah, it's, that's crazy. <laughs> it feels like just yesterday I was struggling with OBS. <laughs> Which actually was probably yesterday, but anyway. <laughs> um, I also uh, run Descent into Avernus on our Twitch stream on Off Wednesdays from one of the Venture Maiden stream, which is very fun. It's actually my first time running a module. And then also I am on another podcast called The Curse of Lords uh, that Kintaro TPC runs. And it's very mysterious and spooky. And I know as much as a as a player, as my character knows. So we're all just trying to figure stuff out in this world. It's really incredible because I know that the Venture Maidens, you you all were friends in real life before you started playing on the show. Uh, How did you get started playing uh, role-playing games? Like how did, how did that come about? So (laughs) we all worked at Starbucks together. We worked at this tiny Starbucks inside of a train station in San Francisco. And it was a nightmare. And so through our trials and tribulations, we got brought together <laughs> <laughs> and became friends. And Celeste having being, you know, playing having played D for uh the better part of two decades, uh decided, you know, I want to start a game up and you all seem like interesting and cool people. So let's start playing D. And we played we started playing, we played 3.5, and my first character was a half-orc monk. Oh, all right. Yes, half-orc monk. How did you arrive? <laughs> uh, were you like, these things are fun, and that's how I will do it? <laughs> uh, it was because like, I love things that don't make sense together necessarily, and I was like, half-orcs are known to be like, or orcs in general known to be ragey and violent and malicious, but uh, I was like, no, I love the idea that this half-orc, he's like, coming to terms with that you know 
history of violence and is choosing to take this this controlled and disciplined and you know kind of righteous path i was like yeah (laughs) wow wow that is uh that's excellent that's really cool so when did you all decide that this was something that needed to be streamed that this was something you know that that you needed to share with the world it was definitely at a point where a few of us had moved away uh, from the Bay Area. So our friends were starting to get spread out all amongst California or, you know, across the United States. And uh, both Celeste got me into the Adventure Zone. Mm. And so we would listen to it as we're like going out, you know, going out to lunch or going out to hikes. And then it was the point where she is definitely the driving factor and being like, you know what? There need to be more voices that aren't just white dudes. And we all play great D&D and we could contribute something significant and wonderful to this community. And, and so, uh, yeah, she texted us on Brittany's birthday and we had our, our, our drunk text message thread of like, we're going to do this. We're so great. I love you all. Yeah. Let's play D and D together. (laughs) (laughs) How do we do that? I don't know. (laughs) Excellent. I mean, that is uh, amazing. And, and, uh, correct uh you know i <laughs> the, <laughs> i just there's so many things about that that it's like yeah that uh, it's i imagine most streams start with people and podcasts begin with uh, i don't know where to start but i'm going to dive in and we're going to do this and we're going to see how it's going to go but then also uh the idea that you did have a lot to say and contribute to the role playing game community i think is correct and i i think listening to the show um from the beginning and watching the audience really grow in a in a big bad way has been amazing yeah, it's amazing <laughs> Yeah, we have over 800,000 downloads now, and that's just incredible. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I know. It's, uh, you know, I, I looked the other day, you had 699 United States iTunes reviews, uh, which is a huge number. That's a massive I, yeah, number. I saw your tweet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hopefully it's, it's uh, you know, 700 by now or, or more. But wow, just just amazing to, to see how the show has grown. So how about running a game, being a dungeon master or a game master? How did that all come about? When was the first time you did that? Because I know you have run games before Descent into Avernus. Yes, definitely. Um, so, so it was probably it was about a year after we started playing D anD D and seeing Celeste run games and everything, and she had been the only one to have run a game. And I got to thinking, I was like, I bet I could do that. Mm-hmm. I bet I could come up with interesting stories. And so the first ever one shot that I ran. It was the the sexy book <laughs> with all of the <laughs> uh, the the book of erotic something the book, is that... the book of erotic fantasy yes right? yes <laughs> and so I was like this is going to be totally weird and different from anything any of us have ever done so you know what why not <laughs> let's try so my yeah my first one shot was a book of erotic fantasy uh, game yeah <laughs> wow. <laughs> You so you really dove right in head first, uh, book of erotic fantasy. Yeah. Oh yeah. I was like, let let's go whole hog. Let's see where this goes. <laughs> uh, it it went it went really well. I would say these doppelgangers had kidnapped this governor's daughter and all the government officials, and they had to figure out like you know, and because they were doppelgangers, like it was yeah, some intrigue. Amazing, amazing. <laughs> so that was that was the first game. The next game that I ran significantly was I did an epic level campaign with a few of my friends in you know in, in 3.5 so they're all level 20 3.5 characters which is to basically say they are gods <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um and that was yeah and so that went on for probably about six months and then the next significant campaign I ran was actually for a different role-playing system called mage the ascension Yes. Yeah. And so we've talked a little bit about Mage the Ascension before on this podcast when we talked about White Wolf games. So how did how did you get into that? Tell me tell me more about Mage the Ascension and your experience with it. Yeah. So Paul, who plays on Descent into Avernus, he got his role playing chops mostly through playing White Wolf games because he had one bad experience with the D&D game where it was like, I'm never doing this again. <laughs> and uh, so, so he and his friends got into uh, White Wolf games. And so the biggest ones are Vampire the Masquerade, uh, Werewolf, 
the apocalypse and mage the ascension and uh so he ran a short campaign for us that unfortunately fell apart because players moved away and schedules you know you know how it goes Right, right. But I absolutely just fell in love with the mage system because the system of magic is just, it's so wonderful because I, it really truly reflects how like magic manifests. And because it is so particular to your character, the way that, you know, my character does magic in a particular way. And according to a paradigm, that would be utterly different from your character, even if we were doing the same kind of magic. And so, and I love esoteric stuff and I, you know, read all about the occult. So it, you know, naturally, naturally drew me in. And so, Mm -hmm. yeah, so I ran, I ran a campaign that lasted for about a year that was set in Hawaii. Wow. Nice. From that point, that was probably, that was about two years ago. And I hadn't, I mostly just been playing, playing a bunch of different games. And so the, the storyteller bug, was starting to grow and i was like i gotta i gotta run another game again and then we went to D beyond uh this past year and getting to get a taste of the things and the settings of avernus and i was like i can't wait for this book to come out because i'm gonna run this game it's gonna be so cool (laughs) and i have not been let down Yes, that's oh, that's so great to hear. I just need to I need to backtrack one second and ask why Hawaii? Why did you want to run a game set in Hawaii? Uh, I think there's a lot of great reasons for it, uh, but that's very cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the indigenous really uh, religion of of like that you can find of indigenous Hawaiian people, um, the very kind of like animistic aspects that religion and that culture is in the language is dying and i think and i really wanted to celebrate that and also i tied it into indigenous activists and fight against climate change fighting against corporate interests who are harming the world um Mm -hmm. and so it's very very activist centered that's really really cool so yeah let's talk about hell (laughs) (laughs) so why did you want to run this adventure what was it about descent into avernus that that like got you excited I think especially being at the D&D live event and you really got this kind of immersive experience in the world and the way that the bazaar was set up and you got to interact with these different NPCs and uh, playing in the D&D epic game. What I what I really loved about it, what really drew me to it is that it the material and the way that your choices matter, it seems completely different than any other D D written like published material. Um, it's very it's very unique, mm. and um, in the way that you're making these very like world affecting choices that you don't in like that you don't necessarily do in the same way in other D D campaigns. Mm. Yes, because um, Curse of Strahd is contained very much in this little bubble. Um, I mean, yeah, but like out of the abyss, you know, you end up fighting fighting some heat big demons as well, but. And I love the way that it tied in the mythology of the blood war and demons and devils and, and everything. So I was like, yes. And steampunk infernal war machines. <laughs> like <laughs> That's all. Aw- yeah. I, I mean, I, I totally agree. And I do think there's something the book even reads differently than other D and D adventures have, you know, Absolutely. Um, especially the, you know, not, not to give too much away, but, there's more than one ending, I guess, is probably the best way to put it. Yeah, it's very much impending on character choices, on how they choose to solve this issue. There isn't, most of the story is very linear, but how it ends is really just totally up to you. And I, I love that. Hey, everybody, I just wanted to take a quick break to let you know that this episode of Tabletop Babble is brought to you by D&D Beyond. D&D Beyond is the official digital tool set of Dungeons and Dragons. Guess what? It is a pretty cool thing to have. If you're a game designer like me, You would constantly have a zillion books open in front of you. You would have to say, uh, which hardback cover was that special monster in? Was it this one? Or wait, was it updated in this one? Oh, wait, hang on. Did it get updated again? Morton Caden's Tome of Foes? I can't remember. 
But guess what? With D&D Beyond, boom, it's all right there, ready to go. I have it open constantly while I am designing. Uh, you should definitely check it out and use it as well. They are just a an incredible product. Uh, they're always pumping out free stuff. You can give them a try for free. Great way to build characters for new players because they can click on spells and boom, the description comes right up. You don't have to go through searching through books. Ah, the possibilities are endless, and there seems to always be a sale going on. So head on over to dndbeyond.com, see what they have to offer you, and tell them DSPN sent you. Let's get back to the babble. When you are thinking about hell, because we've probably got a lot of listeners who are either running this adventure or about to run this adventure, what are some things that that you would say are good tips for people to keep in mind as they are running this adventure. Uh, and and also, uh, without spoiling too much, about where are you at the point of this conversation uh, in running the adventure for the Venture Maidens channel? Because I, I think at this point, it would be pretty easy for people to catch up with you if they if they wanted to do that. Yeah, we've only had three episodes, about two hours each. So the characters right now have just gotten to level three. And the next game that we play will be on on November 20th. I I would say after that game, we will be probably about a third of the way through the adventure. And so the thing that I've noticed in running this game and then watching other uh, streams of people who are starting to play, it goes very fast. The the first five levels are like a whirlwind. Um, (laughs) Yes, agreed. (laughs) Agreed. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, I just, I couldn't believe it. I'm like, yeah, you're next level, you're next level. And I'm like, wow. Um, so I'd say um, a lot of, a lot of dungeon masters um, can feel intimidated when their character, when their players gain levels really quickly. But I would just say, like, embrace it. Don't worry about it. It makes sense. Like, you know, trust, trust the writing in the book. Mm, uh, mm. The thing that I've had to learn about running a story for stream and running it for just like for my friends back home is wow dungeons are really hard and really boring to narrate sometimes (laughs) (laughs) agreed (laughs) and so especially when you're doing theater of the mind um so like what i'm what i'm doing right now is like having gone through the first uh, the first dungeon with the players now like getting getting that experience and moving forward uh, rewriting or like restructuring the way that the dungeons are laid out to make it a little bit easier for the characters to grasp because a lot of the dungeons like curl in on themselves and which is cool if you're you know if you're actually drawing it and you're sitting down at the table and your players are you're all figuring it out together but we don't need to be doing <laughs> it's not not good entertainment <laughs> i think about this all the time because we live and operate in the podcast world right you know venture maidens gets turned into a podcast your game is getting turned into a podcast for patreon listeners uh, or for patreon supporters to also listen to and if you can't describe it in the way that the players who are with you can grasp it in their mind, then there's no way the listeners are going to be able to grasp it either. Right. Right. Exactly. Um, and I, so yeah, I feel very firmly. And if you don't think you can convey it without the text box, if you can't find an accurate or like uh, a good summary of what's going on, scrap it, change it. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter mm-hmm, mm-hmm. as long as you keep the main points. Yeah. And also when you're playing, there's a lot of things that can be fun for players, but not necessarily fun to listen to, right? Like a lot of grindy combat uh, could be fun for a lot of groups, but wow, does it just sound like a lot of math if you're listening to it. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. The 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 dungeons are so full of combat. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> and like very small ones where it's like, you know, a room full of six zombies, which your players can like... Mm-hmm. Pro, like uh, like overtake pretty easily but like do you need to do that maybe not necessarily um <laughs> yeah it's yeah. it's funny listening to uh streams and and or listening to podcasts and watching streams and has really taught me that if combat is not fun or you're having a night where there's just too much of it right and it's like oh that you can really cut a lot of that out of a dungeon it'll still be a hard time you'll still have player characters using resources and and getting knocked down and you know yeah exactly um, if you if you trim some of that excess stuff or you could use it if you love it 
as far as content like Descent into Avernus, I think can be intimidating to some people because it's heavy. Um, you know, they they see hell, they see Baldur's Gate, which is like not a friendly place either. <laughs> Do you find that it gets too heavy? Do you have ways to to lighten it up or bring levity? Well, the I'm very fortunate to have such a great group of players who mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Are, oh my god, like JB cracks me up so much and just his and because their characters are also are so lively and they role play their characters so well that they create these wonderful magic moments in these dark and terrible places and so as a storyteller it is absolutely your job to like help foster that and nurture that and encourage that to help keep your players motivated and happy and not to to you know drug down with like oh god we gotta fight all these evil cultists and you know so they they definitely really really carry that yeah and that's one of the fun things right you can find the funny moments and they can be unexpected and there can be dark comedy as well so i know you haven't gotten too much into uh into deal making but are you excited to get into wheeling and dealing as it were Oh, absolutely. I think coming probably two games from now, there's going to be a huge opportunity for one of the characters to make a fairly significant choice with an artifact that they will uncover. And uh, I think what I what probably one of the things that I love most about being a storyteller is when characters give me backstories and getting to work in and tie in those backstories. And so, uh, yes, so one one of the characters' backstories will definitely come up and will be a part of this wheeling and dealing. So you're running a, a published adventure. How often are you finding that the players will do something not covered by the text or want to go somewhere not covered by the text? And what do you do when that happens? That actually hasn't happened yet. Uh, What I do really appreciate about Avernus is that it gives you, in in the written published material, it gives you so many suggestions of if your players like get off the track or they decide not to do this, here are some suggestions on how you can get them back on track. And I think that's the really the first time that I've seen that in um in D and D published material. And I think that's it's such a it's such a big help and a boon for possibly new storytellers or people who've never run modules before. So you feel like you have some tools at your disposal <laughs> <laughs> to, to do that. I think part of it definitely is, is laying out clear delineated goals. Even if the characters aren't necessarily interested, like, like Celeste character, Melody is not necessarily interested in, getting to these ends but finding ways through that that character that character's personality of how it would tie in and helping helping players find their motivations for why maybe their characters would care that's great advice how much prep are you doing uh before an episode uh so like like part of part of the reason why i've never been particularly interested in running modules you know, over my D playing history is because of taking a some material that someone else wrote and trying to synthesize it and present it in a way that is authentic. For me, it's so easy to through homebrew worlds and present stories that I came up with. And but when taking someone else's material and pre- trying to present it as you know, like my own in a way that's you know unique to me is was a very daunting task. And so what I do because I'm an academic, um, I you know, read through a section that I know that they're going to go over next. I take, I take extensive notes. I rewrite descriptions in my own hand in the way that like I would want, you know, rooms or challenges or things to be presented. Um, so that when I, when I convey that information, it doesn't sound chunky or like it's not my voice in the way that it, it feels authentic. Um, so I have tons of notes. <laughs> <laughs> so many papers i'm definitely one of those story pl- the storytellers that's got like a i have a binder <laughs> and it's color coded and i've got you know the tags on the monster manuals for the things that we're gonna bring yeah it's i got i got a system right wow that's i mean that's incredible and that's a lot of work to do to 
keep something smooth and authentic. And I, my hat is off to you. You know, I'm sure my listeners may know that I have a thing about box text and uh, it's a ongoing war that I'm waging online uh, that it's there's probably much, much, much better hills for me to die on. Um, but uh, <laughs> but, you know, I'm in it now. It's like if I get out now, it's it's too late. So um, I, I applaud you for like going through and rewriting everything so that it sounds like it's coming from you and natural. And that's not easy work to do, especially when you've kind of got the the safety net, right, of like, hey, the work is done for you. Why rewrite it? Um, so uh, and there's there's good reason to do that. So, wow. Congratulations on working hard and having it pay off because it's uh, it really does uh, come off as a very seamless, uh, fun uh, sort of time. And uh, l- much like when Celeste runs Venture Maidens reminds me of like, this is a game I could see myself playing uh, with some of the most amazing players in the world, right? You know, like that's that's sort of how it comes across as like, wow, there everybody is such good friends. Everybody is having a great time and everybody is real, real good at this. You know, from the, from the other side, from the player perspective, when you're playing Kara in Venture Maidens, uh, how is it different uh, playing on a stream and a podcast than it is when you're playing, you know, just at home around the table with no nothing recording you. Well, through 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 playing Kara um, has really helped inform me as a player at when I'm just at like we're gonna play D and D later today with my friends. Um, and through um, because before before I played Kara, I was a very kind of quiet player. Um, very kind of unsure to make choices or to make bold stances, even though really yeah right. That's fascinating. <laughs> um, wow. And I think uh because because my friend my friend group, you know, were all such a of this like wonderful mix of very big and bold personalities. So I being being new to role playing games, I felt very intimidated to step to step into the light, um, unless it was specifically directed by who is ever running the game. Um, and to make and to make bold choices and stances and be like, no, this is what my character would do. And like, you know, um, and to, to maybe to because I'm very non-confrontational. I'm a very non-confrontational person. Um, and so playing Kara has really helped me be bold and assert myself at the table and stand up for my characters. And and so, yeah, so. That's great. Your group, the the Venture Maidens, and the group that that you're running for uh, for Descent into Avernus, who Venture Venture Maidens Plus, I guess you know there's there's more <laughs> yeah. people. Um, venture Maidens and friends. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's everyone is so gregarious and dynamic, uh, but also knows how to support each other and when to sort of step back and let somebody else step forward and you as a dm and celeste as a dm do good jobs of being the referees and and bringing people into and out of the spotlight and things like that it's great because it really does show other people for their home games uh how to to be able to do that right and how you can be like Yes, you can be a big player who grabs the spotlight and is the center of attention, but also you know how to throw that spotlight over onto somebody else, which I think is is really special uh, and really shows the bond that you all have as a group. And also, and speaking of cool characters and cool decisions, uh, so uh, th- we may need a little backstory here, but I was wondering if you could talk about why Kara has taken a level of cleric. Oh, she actually has five five levels of cleric. right right yes um so when we started venture maidens xanathar's guide to everything where they have the new subclasses yes um, that hadn't been published yet and in that book there is the subclass for the ancestral guardian uh mm. barbarian class and that's when i envisioned kara like that's something that i really wanted for her but it, d- it didn't exist yet sure <laughs> and so and so when that material came out as soon as i saw it i texted celeste and i was like i would really love to rebuild car using this subclass um because it really ties into how like her kind of like the kind of ancestor worship that she that she feels and that yeah some of how i really kind of envisioned her when i first made her but now there are the tools to do that 
And so, bless Celeste. <laughs> uh, like a year later, it it finally came to fruition in the most wonderful way with saving her dad's souls from purgatory. And I really want, um, and through playing Kara, you know, she, Kara started off as very much a hothead and she still is. And, but she's very stubborn and very kind of self focused. And her kind of character development over time has led her to become, becoming more lawful, becoming in, in her alignment. And because she started off as chaotic chaotic good <laughs> as it, i believe we had a conversation where you told me kara is based on carl from aqua Teen hunger force yes that's where the <laughs> voice comes from <laughs> it's my poor imitation of carl <laughs> <laughs> i think it's pretty great it, it, when you said it i was like oh wow it is carl oh, i didn't realize that that's awesome <laughs> um and so she started off because you know like like any like any kind of teenager you know you you throw off the shackles of your of your parents and society and you did she and so she went out and she rebelled and she needed to get away and through her journey, she's become, you know, come to realize that there is there is power and there's strength and there's purpose in having law and order and working towards a greater purpose. And so that's been such a huge part of her character development. And then, you know, being with these two, now three other companions in these life endangering events, she's learned to become supportive and how to to lift up a team and try and be a leader and so that's where her levels in cleric comes in because all of her cleric spells that she has are about bolstering her friends and their and and healing and so and it's about um as much as kara <laughs> wants to be the the spotlight she re- and like be the driving force she recognizes that you need to bring people with you too it, you can't just do it all by yourself that's a, I mean, that's a, that's a very cool arc. You don't see a lot of dwarf warriors uh, who necessarily have these big, rich arcs. Part of because like they're this, they're one of the simplest and most straightforward things mechanically, and so are often played by uh, folks who prefer a simple and more straightforward story, right? And so it, it's just been very cool to see this evolution of a dynamic character over now four years. Wow, I, it's still crazy to me. And I also know this first story of Venture Maidens is coming eventually to a close. Uh, I know that Celeste has talked about it a little bit on Twitter. So what are you thinking about it in terms of, of Kara? I know you probably can't talk about and you and you may not know, but uh, as you're coming to a close with something that you've spent four years with a lot of D and D campaigns don't last four years, let alone actually come to a close. People don't often get the chance that you're going to have. Uh, and you're going to have an audience of uh, thousands uh, listening to uh, possibly, uh, you know, by then you'll be over 1 million downloads knocking on wood, listening to your, your story and the story of Kara. And that's amazing. Uh, no pressure. Uh, so <laughs> what are you, <laughs> what are you, <laughs> what are you kind of thinking about, I, I guess, uh, as you get to the end? I'm not even sure if that's really a question, but, you know, what's what's going through your mind? Yeah, so uh, with with all of my characters, I make very clear and deliberate choices, and I reflect constantly on their evolution. And so it's no coincidence that Kara has gone through this development. It's because I've I've made I spent a lot of time deliberating about how does she feel, what would she do next, you know, and and all these sort of things. So, uh, what I've thought, uh, I think Kara has found great purpose in working for the Sisters of Sorrow, and I think ultimately she would want to become like Lord Commander and or you know some other you know very high ranking office and because i feel like she feels very much at home there and this is her this is where her sense of purpose derives from you know she gets it from her work from commanding from fighting from you know facing the the forces of darkness and so she she would never want to give that up she's not going to retire to a to a tavern (laughs) (laughs) nice nice Uh, once wants to go down swinging probably oh yeah like might be 
I don't know, dwarf years, 400 years old, still swinging that ax. <laughs> uh, Absolutely. <laughs> so, yeah, that is really cool. So do you think playing Kara on Venture Maidens has influenced, and, and playing on other shows as well, has influenced the way you're running Descent into a Burns? I, I mean, yeah, playing Kara and then just, just yeah, playing on shows in general um, definitely has influenced me as a storyteller um, because the way that Venture Maidens plays out, very specifically Venture Maidens plays out, it's, it's like a serial drama, which are my favorite shows to watch. Um, you know, every, <laughs> every episode, something is happening that's grabbing your attention and so you have to you have to move in, you have to make the choice, you have to, you know, suffer the consequences. And so, um, so yeah, so running Avernus, that has definitely, that's definitely become to play to you know to say to put to be able to put on the pressure and show what an existential threat this is very cool that's very very cool as we're wrapping up here is there anything else you want people to know about venture maidens and uh, descent into avernus oh if you didn't catch the halloween special or if you did (laughs) i wrote out my one shot that i wrote that's available to uh, all of our venture maintenance patreons and you get to get a wonderful glimpse into the horror of my mind <laughs> and run this adventure for your own friends <laughs> <laughs> yes people should definitely check it out the, the halloween episode is up uh, as well over at don't split the podcast network.com it's fantastic so not only if you subscribe to your patreon will you get that you'll get the episodes of sage running descent into avernus which mm-hmm. is pretty awesome for only a dollar a month Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> it, it, I mean, it really is a great deal. It's like 50 cents or less a podcast, basically, uh, plus a bunch of other stuff that you get um, when you subscribe. So if people want to follow you, Sage, uh, where should they go? What should they do? Yes. Yeah, so on all of the social media outlets, you can find me at Staff of Sage, Twitter, Instagram, what have you. Um, and then, yes, Venture Maidens, we stream. We alternate between Descent into Avernus and Venture Maiden. So the 20th is going to be Avernus and then 1127 is Celeste's birthday. So uh, we won't be doing anything that day. So happy birthday, Celeste. We love you. You do so much. (laughs) Um, And so, yeah, you can catch us catch us on Twitch at our Venture Maidens channel. Well, people should definitely go uh, check it out. Uh, Sage, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, I really, really appreciate it. And uh, we'll have you back on soon. Yeah, thanks for having me back. That was a great interview with Sage. You know, people, if you like the Venture Maidens and if you like Tabletop Babble, you should head on over to iTunes and leave us five-star reviews. It helps us so much. In fact, if you're listening in Apple Podcasts right now, you can just click on over and leave us a five-star review as you're hearing my voice asking you to do it. It is such a huge help. It only takes 30 seconds of your time. And guess what? If you leave a five-star review for Tabletop Babble, I will read it out loud here on the show. You can make me say anything you want. And guess what? Uh, This show is not cheap to make, and I could use your help. Honestly, if you've been listening to Tabletop Babble for a while, I hope it's worth at least a dollar a month to you to get this content into your ears. Uh, If you have the money and you can spare helping us out, head on over to patreon.com slash intracasso. That's patreon.com slash intracasso, where you can find all sorts of reward options, but the real reward is continuing to help make this show a reality. I really appreciate everybody who is already giving on the Patreon. Thank you so, so much. All right, people, you can find me on Twitter at James Intracasso and at worldbuilderblog.com. Tabletop Babble is a show on the Don't Split the Podcast Network. Thanks to Rudy Basso for founding it with me. Our theme music, which you're listening to right now, was provided by Battle Bards. Don't forget, RPGs are like sex.
everybody, before we go, I wanted to let you know that this episode of Tabletop Babble was brought to you by Cobalt Press. Cobalt Press are the makers of a lot of amazing, amazing products, including the complete Cobalt Guide to Game Design 2nd Edition, the ultimate resource for gamers, game masters, and designers. The first edition won in any because it laid out concepts, techniques, and advice for designing role-playing games and enhancing adventures. Now the second edition brings together the essays from the original volume. Many have been updated to reflect the changing game design landscape. And there's new essays too by veteran designers like Jeff Grubb, Kelly Pollock, Amber Scott, and... Ray Valise. Get practical, thought-provoking essays on world building, creating magic systems, conflicts, and compelling stories. What to expect when you work as a game design professional and so much more. Conceptual chapters examine what game design is and how to create a good game. There are concrete examples provided so you can make great well-rounded games with the complete Cobalt Guide to Game Design 2nd Edition, which you can get now at cobaltpress.com. Tell them DSPN sent you.